The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash YSX860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to Solving the Challenge of Tumor Lysis Syndrome. I'm Dr. Anthony Mato from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I'm pleased to welcome my nurse practitioner and colleague, Kristen Badiato. Today we're going to explore the team-based management of an important oncologic emergency, tumor lysis syndrome, which is particularly relevant for many patients with cancer, since often the use of highly effective modern therapies can precipitate this serious complication. Throughout the discussion, we'll use cases to give you a sense of how professionals can work together to identify risk factors for TLS, recognize its laboratory and clinical symptoms, and prevent its occurrence. During this program, we will also share several resources for tumor lysis syndrome prevention and management. You'll want to refer to these practice aids throughout our discussion, so please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. Let's begin. So here we have the outline of the scope of the problem, why tumor lysis syndrome is an important and serious oncologic emergency. And probably the best place to start out is to just define what is tumor lysis syndrome or TLS. This is the rapid breakdown of cancer cells in the body, which can lead to an increase in levels of uric acid, potassium, and phosphorus. And when levels rise faster than the kidneys can remove them, this can cause tumor lysis syndrome. It's both a laboratory and a clinical complication. Changes in blood levels of uric acid, potassium, phosphorus, and calcium can affect several organs, uh, including the kidneys, the heart, the brains, the muscles, and the GI tract. So since several organ systems are affected, it can become quite dangerous for patients, particularly if the heart or brain or kidney are affected. Let's delve a little bit more into tumor lysis syndrome and what factors can increase the risk of TLS. I've listed some here, including the extent of the tumor burden, tumors with high rates of proliferation, so you'll see most of our conversation will be around hematologic malignancies, tumors with high sensitivity to chemotherapy, and I'd broaden that actually to say chemotherapies, plural, including targeted therapies and immunotherapy, or pre-existing renal disease or impairment. The most common hematologic malignancies associated with TLS or the most common malignancies in general associated with TLS include non-Hodgkin lymphoma, solid tumors, a relatively rare event, AML, and ALL. Largely, this is a problem, as stated before, of hematologic malignancies. Overall, the in-hospital mortality due to tumor lysis syndrome can be 21%. Therefore, it's very important uh, to have an interprofessional and multidisciplinary team which can assess for risk factors for TLS and plan appropriately for prophylaxis um, Um, identification, and then treatment intervention should it occur. And this is a conversation today between Kristen and I, but certainly uh, when we're practicing, our conversation about TLS is much more broad, which includes cardiologists, pharmacists, um, nephrologists, and so on and so forth. So this is really a multidisciplinary approach that's um, quite important in order to address this issue. How can the team prepare for and mitigate the challenges of tumor lysis syndrome? Well, we'll start by discussing a case, and this is patient Eleanor, who presents for symptomatic CLL. What is her risk factor for tumor lysis syndrome? And for those of you who are not familiar with hematologic malignancy, CLL stands for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So this 62-year-old patient presents with splenomegaly and fatigue. She has a good performance status, but she does have significant lymphadenopathy. About 7 centimeters is her largest lymph node. Her creatinine clearance is somewhat diminished at 53 mLs per minute. She doesn't have any poor risk features, including the deletion 17P, TP53 mutation, but she is mutated for IGHV. Her baseline uric acid is not elevated. Now, in addition to her lymphadenopathy and her splenomegaly, we also can have other ways of assessing the bulk of her disease, including her white blood cell count, which is 95,000, quite high. She has an elevated absolute lymphocyte count. Hemoglobin is depressed at 10.8, and platelets are depressed at 72. We'll come back to this patient shortly, but here's some things that you should consider. Does her presentation increase the likelihood of TLS? 
What about potential treatment strategies for her CLL, such as venetoclax or BTK inhibitors? Would those therapies also increase the risk for tumor lysis syndrome? So here we have a listing of several malignancies known to increase the risk of tumor lysis syndrome. By far and away from all of the textbooks, Burkitt's lymphoma uh, and ALL, B-cell ALL are highest on the list. Um, you can also consider other um, diseases as high risk, particularly AML when there's a really high white blood cell count greater than 50,000 with monoblastic disease. Again, I mentioned ALL with bulky disease with a white count of greater than 100,000. Intermediate risk include diseases like DLBCL, ALL and AML with lower counts, and CLL um, when the white count is between 10 and 100,000. Here the reference is fludarabine treatment, but as you see, the field has evolved, and so we'll talk about newer, modern, more modern therapies. And then lower risk includes some of the same diseases like AML, ALL, CLL, and then other um, B-cell malignancies like myeloma, Hodgkin lymphoma, the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, CML is listed there, although it's rare, and then least on the list is solid tumors. Um, of course, this is an evolving list, and the th one of the factors that I mentioned earlier is the success of the therapies. And so for diseases like CLL or some of the lymphomas where we have more and more effective therapies that are targeted but can still cause a rapid cell kill, these may change and the risk of tumor lysis may go up. So it's not only about the disease or the bulk of the disease, but of course, how effective are the therapies that we're using to treat TLS? Here we have patient and treatment related factors to consider. Patient factors uh, are those that you might think about just by understanding physiology, dehydration, oliguria or anuria, baseline renal dysfunction, acidic urine, which may affect uh, the processing of uric acid and phosphate, leukocytosis, um, exec, um, lymph node involvement, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, high tumor burden, hyperuricemia, increased serum lactate dehydrogenase. Some of what these are alluding to is that patients can sometimes present with what we call spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome. So they may be in TLS even before they're treated. And then of course the therapies, and this is a, a really an incomplete list, but you can just see there are immunotherapies, chemotherapies, corticosteroids, and then targeted therapies. One example that we'll talk a lot about is venetoclax with obinutuzumab as a potential risk for TLS in patients with CLL. Okay, so now Kristen and I are gonna rejoin the conversation. Remember, this patient is 62, they're bulky based on their white count and their, um, and their uh, lymphadenopathy. We don't have a spleen measurement, but let's assume it's like five or six centimeters below the costal margin. They don't have any baseline um, hyperuricemia, but their white count is quite high. So Kristen, um, you and I see patients every day. We're gonna actually be in clinic tomorrow. I'm in clinic right now. We see patients getting venetoclax all the time. Can you just, just help me and help others to think about how do we um, think about risk stratification for TLS? What, do you, what are the factors that you plug into that um, equation? Yeah, in Eleanor's case, we're going to pay special attention to her white blood cell count and her absolute lymphocyte count. Her absolute lymphocyte count is significantly elevated at 23,000, and she's got some significant lymph node bulk with 7 centimeters. We consider any, high any patient high risk for tumor lysis who present with any lymph node greater than 10 centimeters or an absolute lymphocyte count greater than 25,000 with lymphadenopathy between 5 to 10 centimeters. So Eleanor here is going to be considered medium to intermediate, intermediate risk for tumor lysis. However, the presence of her splenomegaly and um, her decreased creatinine clearance put, puts her at increased risk. So if you want to go ahead and treat her in the outpatient setting, we have to make sure that she's going to be compliant with her allopurinol prophylaxis and she's going to be able to stay well hydrated. Kristen, assuming we're using venetoclax, anything else there? Um, you know, to me, the creatinine clearance that's somewhat depressed um, at 53, maybe um, it, that might actually compound a little bit with the uh, medium risk for TLS. Having a little bit of renal dysfunction, I think, is, is somewhat concerning, may increase the risk a bit. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, you know, we should have a low threshold to admit her for more aggressive tumor lys lysis monitoring in addition to IV hydration. And then what's reassuring to me is that thankfully the uric acid isn't elevated. Um, so, you know, of course we have different choices for what therapies we're going to give patients. She'll receive venetoclax, let's just say. Um, of course, we're both familiar with the fact that venetoclax is such an active agent, um, particularly at its higher doses, uh, 
that, uh, that will increase the risk for developing TLS, but we'll get more into that uh, as we go through the case. Um, anytime we have a therapy that's active that will debulk a patient in a matter of days or, or weeks, um, those patients may become at an increased risk for the body not being able to keep up with the cell destruction. So here we're having a little bit more detail on risk stratification uh, for TLS. Again, here we're focusing on the team-based approach uh, for prevention and management. So you saw what Kristen and I just did. We saw this patient where looking at their renal function, their white count, their ALC, their um, spleen size, their lymph node size, we're risk stratifying them. Kristen correctly came up with the fact that this patient is intermediate risk. Um, maybe the renal dysfunction um, affects what we're doing. So, of course, the art of taking care of TLS is to not let it happen in the first place. You need to be able to define it. Here we're mentioning the laboratory values of node, including uric acid, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. Here we even would consider initiating cross-discipline consultations. If the patient had some underlying cardiac disease or if they had renal dysfunction, you might want to get the nephrologist or um, cardiologist involved a little bit early. You might want to think about telemetry. You want to look for drug-drug interactions with the pharmacist. You want to be able to make sure that you're providing appropriate monitoring and prophylaxis. Um, I think, Kristen, you'd agree with me. The mainstay of preventing TLS is just hydration, um, oral hydration and or IV hydration. For an intermediate risk patient, is your mainstay then IV hydration for patients? Yeah, it's recommended strongly that we give IV hydration both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Um, people who are outpatient, um, we usually give about 1.5 to 2 liters of IV hydration on days one and two of each weekly ramp up with venetoclax or on the days that they're getting obinutuzumab. Um, this will definitely help mitigate the risk of tumor lysis. In addition to an anti-uracemic agent such as allopurinol, which we usually start around three to seven days prior to initiation of therapy. I think what you said is key. Starting allopurinol on day one or day, you know, day zero, whatever you want to call it, um, won't be very effective. This is an agent that if you don't think about it in advance, you're not going to be successful using it. So allopurinol is our mainstay as our anti-hyperuricemic agent. It does have some side effects. You can see fevers, you can see rash, you can see liver dysfunction. So we're, we're not only monitoring for TLS, but we're also monitoring for side effects from some of the medicines we use. And we'll get a little bit into um, other choices, but occasionally we are using febuxostat. We are occasionally using case for particularly high-risk patients. So hydration, monitoring, um, and then anti-hyperuricemic prophylaxis are really the keys. Here we have um, a deeper dive into the elements of TLS monitoring. So I'll go through some of this, and then um, Kristen, you and I will kind of just chime in and have some conversation uh, baseline EKGs, I think, is a, a standard of, at our center when we're starting new therapies, particularly when there's an anti-CD20 antibody involved, but certainly for venetoclax, it's very reasonable. Um, I, I can't remember the last person who required continuous cardiac monitoring. Uh, what about you? These are people for who have active signs of lysis who are probably admitted um, for management of tumor lysis. So that's when you're going to go ahead and get you know cardiology involved, renal, and critical care if applicable. But um, but for our for our you know high risk patients who have no signs of active lysis, it's not always it's not it's not always necessary. But it's something you should consider. And the other thing we didn't comment on here, you know, this is a general conversation about TLS, but we are having some um, some specific conversation about venetoclax is that not only when you're um, identifying the risk and the setting where you're going to monitor a patient, but the frequency of labs does need to factor in across the blood cancers. I say in general, as a general rule of thumb with ALL or AML or CLL, we're checking labs approximately every eight hours, particularly in the inpatient setting. But just keep in mind with venetoclax, there is a package insert which gives guidance for frequency of laboratory assessments depending on the risk and the setting for which a patient is uh, being monitored. So just keep that in mind. Um, patients with active laboratory or clinical TLS require additional things, and we should talk about those. Um, you know, what's your, if you see a patient who has, well, I'll put it to you this way my general rule of thumb is treat whatever the abnormality is. So, what are some of the, the things that you use, for example, for hyperkalemia or hyperphosphatemia or renal dysfunction? 
Yeah, so if the hyperkalemia is mild and it can, it's being managed in the outpatient setting, we often reach for I, IV furosemide or even K-exalate to bring down those uh, potassium levels. If someone's having uh, acute arrhythmias um, in the setting, we even um, reach for IV calcium gluconate, but that's usually pretty rare. And then at that point, you want to consult cardiology, absolutely. In the setting of hyperphosphatemia, um, um, you're going to reach for additional IV fluids and even um, consider a FOS binder like Selvamir, which can be really helpful. Um, hyperuricemia, the patients are going to hopefully be on allopurinol three to seven days prior. And you also want to make sure you check a G6PD, make sure they're not G6PD deficient, because if you give risperacase in the setting of a G6PD deficiency, they can develop life-threatening hemolytic anemia or methemoglobinemia. So that's something you, you actually want to grab or review before you even start therapy with, um, with patients. Um, so and additionally, you know, anytime you have active signs of tumor lysis, IV fluids are going to be your friend. I just want to note, though, um, you know, the, the potassium, the phosphorus, and the uric acid levels can all be elevated in the setting of tumor lysis. However, calcium can drop. So um, we can see hypocalcemia in the setting of tumor lysis. You never want to replete a calcium, a patient who's hypocalcemic, who is not symptomatic, okay? As long as they're asymptomatic, it's okay to go ahead and just monitor. And along those lines, you never want to use a FOS binder that's calcium containing because that's essentially the same as what Kristen was just describing. All right, so now into the oncologist nurse collaboration. When monitoring for TLS, what are the signs you look for? Um, I'll, I'll mention the laboratory ones, and then Kristen, you can mention the clinical ones. So tumor lysis syndrome is hopefully only a laboratory diagnosis for most patients. You have to have two or more of the following criteria achieved within a 24-hour period. Um, from three days before to seven days after um, treatment initiation. Of course, the time frame may not be completely relevant. Um, some things can happen a little bit earlier in spontaneous case or later. So just use your clinical judgment. But increases in, in uric acid, you can see there are 25% or, um, or greater than or equal to eight. Potassium increase, that's important to note. You may go from normal to normal, but that could still be TLS. If you have a patient go from three to 4.5, that's worrisome. Still both are within the normal range greater than or equal to six, that's an emergency. Phosphate, uh, you can see there, 25% uh, increase from baseline, or greater than or equal to 0.5 um, mg per deciliter. Um, and then calcium, as Kristen already mentioned, goes down, and so a lower calcium level is what we would observe. That's usually due to calcium phosphate precipitation. And then the clinical features, uh, Kristen, just briefly. Yeah, so clinical tumor lysis is when you have evidence of a laboratory tumor lysis in addition to signs of end organ damage. This can manifest in the setting of an elevated creatinine greater than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, seizures, and cardiac arrhythmia, which can even lead to sudden death. So this is absolutely an oncologic emergency and needs prompt intervention. Thankfully, we're, none, neither of us are too familiar with clinical TLS. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, again, sticking with team-based strategies, what would be useful in Eleanor's case? So just, um, Kristen already covered a lot of this, but the, for the low-risk patient, we want to monitor patients, use clinical judgment um, for how much hydration. Uh, allopurinol should be a mainstay of therapy. You can consider PO versus IV hydration. Kristen, why don't you cover the intermediate risk patient? That's the case, and then I'll cover the high risk. Yeah, so Eleanor, like you said, we're going to have her increase her oral um, hydration three to, uh, two to three days prior to starting therapy. Um, we want her to hit about 1.5 to 2 liters orally. In addition to the IV hydration we're going to provide, if we are going to treat her in the outpatient setting, she'll get a, an additional 1.5 to 2 liters IV. Um, like I said, allopurinol three to seven days prior is mainstay, and we want to make sure we have that G6PD deficiency back and make sure she's not deficient. Um, Risperacase cannot be used in the setting of a G6PD deficiency. However, we can, we can utilize it if she's not, especially in the setting of hyperuricemia. And I'll be the first one to say that when you give it in the setting of hyperuricemia, it really does work quite well. You can see uric acids uh, go from elevated to almost undetectable. Just remember, once you give um, respiracase, you need to check subsequent uric acids on ice because this is an enzyme. And then for high-risk patients, um, again, high-risk and median risk are um, not very different from one another. In my mind, intermediate-risk patients can be done in or outpatient depending on your comfort level, your setting. High-risk patients should probably all initiate treatments like venetoclax in the hospital. Uh, they're all mandated to have hydration. You can either use respiracase or allopurinol, depending on the patient and other comorbidities. Uh, once again, please download this algorithm on risk-based TLS uh, prophylaxis. 
along with other tools we've made available as a useful resource for developing plans for risk assessment, monitoring, and prevention. Okay, so now we're back to Eleanor again. Uh, she's being seen a lot in our clinic today. So again, 62-year-old patient, has splenomegaly, high white count, low hemoglobin and platelet count, decreased renal function. The patient is getting obinutuzumab with venetoclax. We call this the CLL-14 regimen. Um, now here's a little bit more detail on what we do. So pretreatment CT scans were, are checked to assess for internal lymphadenopathy. Even though Kristen was um, astute in pointing out that the seven centimeter lymph node and the white count slash ALC made this patient intermediate risk, all, for all we know, they have a 12 centimeter intra-abdominal lymph node, which would change it to high risk. Um, Kristen pointed out to everyone that G6PD should be checked way in advance of starting therapy. It was checked. There was no deficiency, so respiracase is on the table. Kristen pointed out this patient should be well hydrated. They are following what we recommended, and they're taking pretreatment hydration. And then allopurinol was started six days in advance and therefore it's likely active in reducing uh, hyperuricemia for this patient. So in my mind, everything is done right in this particular situation to, in order to risk stratify the patient and prior to the initiation of therapy to uh, minimize the risk based on hydration and anti-hyperuricemic agents. So when people come in for venetoclax-based uh, therapy in the outpatient setting, what we often do is we'll bring them in early to get a pre uh, a pre-dose set of labs to, uh, to monitor for any metabolic abnormalities. And if there are any metabolic abnormalities, you want to go ahead and go ahead and correct them promptly prior to starting therapy. Once you had once you go ahead and dose the patient with venetoclax in the outpatient setting, you're going to go ahead and repeat labs eight six to eight hours post dosing, and again at 24 hours. These patients are also going to receive um, weekly. I'm sorry, daily hydration on days one and two of each weekly ramp up for venetoclax. And like I said, they're gonna continue um, allopurinol throughout the five week ramp up. Okay, we're back to Eleanor again. Um, again, remember this is a 62 year old. She's got bulky disease, intermediate risk for TLS. She gets allopurinol as um, six days in advance, IV fluids as recommended, but you're monitoring this patient and um, relatively quickly in the course of therapy, she goes from a normal uric acid to a, a level of 10, uh, switches to resveracase. Anything uh, to add there, Kristen? Would you admit this patient? I'm curious if you, if you went from a uric acid of 2 to 10 um, and your, your 6 p.m. lab show, show that, what would you do? Yeah, I would, I would tell Eleanor to pack a bag and head over to urgent care for more aggressive monitoring. Um, that is troublesome, especially in the setting of her impaired renal function. Um, so she's going to need aggressive IV hydration and, and more aggressive lab monitoring, um, and she needs to be observed at least overnight. Yeah, and it's interesting because if you look at the definition of TLS, this patient doesn't actually meet that definition. This is where clinical judgment comes in. Right? You know, I would say that they have treatment-induced hyperuricemia, but that doesn't mean that that elevated uric acid can't lead to renal dysfunction, for example, by uric acid um, crystallizing in the renal tubules, or if then renal dysfunction, then hyperkalemia. So it becomes sort of a, um, a string of events. Fortunately, in this case, we're probably catching it early, but I would agree, admit for fluids, give respiratory case uh, if appropriate, and try to minimize the, this becoming either full-blown laboratory TLS or uh, a clinical consequence. So here we have uh, TLS management. It can be customized based on risk changes uh, in important laboratory values. So again, the low risk patient, it's pretty straightforward. These people are low risk and oftentimes don't get into trouble, although it's not impossible. So you still have to take it very seriously because you may be able to look at the bulk of disease pretreatment, but if they have a tumor that's exquisitely sensitive to a particular therapy, they can get into trouble. Um, Kristen already covered a lot of this, but intermediate risk, monitoring hydration, allopurinol, case if there's a problem. And then this is just the beginning of the list. Keep in mind, it's not only about hyperuricemia, but they can also develop hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, arrhythmia, so on and so forth. You identify the problem and you treat it. Um, we're just highlighting one issue here. And then high risk, of course, different setting, but very similar management, maybe more erring towards using case as prophylaxis there, um, but it's not absolutely mandatory. Okay, so we're back to the case, uh, and now the same patient, Eleanor, similar presentation, except now the ALC is 30, the lymphadenopathy is 7 centimeter, still has some renal dysfunction, uh, 
and is presenting with hyperuricemia at baseline. That's quite worrisome. But still, this patient is recommended to receive venetoclaxel venetuzumab. Scans are performed, uh, may even show some bigger lymph nodes inside. They, again, are not G6PD deficient. They follow the fluid uh, recommendations. And then six days prior, they start, um, actually, in this case, six days prior to venetoclax ramp up, I'd still have them start allopurinol. But here, we're thinking about using rasburicase as a prophylactic measure. So, Kristen, uh, of course, you're not going to give rasburicase six days prior, uh, would you? Or what would you do? Would you start allopurinol, and then if there's still hyperuricemia, give rasburicase on the day of treatment? Yeah, I would, I would give her at least a three to seven days worth of allopurinol and then um, hit her with IV hydration. And then right before you're going to start therapy, I'd give her a dose of rasburicase and recheck those uric acid levels before dosing. Um, again, like you said, she's higher risk, so that I, I believe this should all be done in, in inpatient with, for more aggressive monitoring. This patient I would call high risk for many reasons. I mean, the ALC, the bulky disease. Um, you, I mean, if we saw this patient tomorrow in clinic and we were planning on starting venetoclax later, like in the week, I still might admit them, again, for hydration, allopurinol. And if, the, if there was any renal dysfunction concomitant with the hyperuricemia, then that's where I probably would even give case prior to the start of therapy. So here we have high risk, uh, and we've mentioned this already, um, but these patients are high risk for a reason. They are not only likely to develop laboratory issues, can, but can develop the clinical sequela of TLS. And so these people are admitted, they're monitored even more closely, labs very frequently. In the setting of venetoclax, you'll check pre-dose labs, four-hour labs, 12-hour labs, 24-hour labs. Hydration is more aggressive, respiracase used more frequently than not for prophylaxis. Yeah, so current recommendations for hydration and dosing of anti-hyperuricemics um, include, um, like we talked about before, patients who are high risk are going to get usually continuous IV hydration while inpatient. Um, patients who are on the outpatient setting, it's recommended for at least 1.5 to 2 liters for both high and medium risk patients. Um, for medium risk patients, you can consider oral, though IV hydration is strongly considered. You should strongly consider. Uh, Low-risk patients can actually get away with oral hydration if they're able to do it. Um, you have to pay uh, particular attention to those elderly patients who struggle with, with oral hydration, and it's recommended about 1.5 to 2 liters daily. Um, allopurinol dosing, we usually give 300 milligrams daily, but however, you have to adjust for renal, renal dysfunction. In regards to case, the package insert notes uh, the dosing is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram as a 30-minute infusion, up to five days, but it's very rare that you'd give five days of IV case. Usually patients need a dose or two, and that, that, would, that should treat the hyperuricemia, hyperuricemia adequately. Usually in our institution, we give a flat dose of three or six milligrams, and it's, and it's quite um, efficient. Uh, there's no dose adjustment required for, for patients with renal dysfunction, and like I said, no one usually gets it well, beyond five days. So unfortunately, these anti-hyperuricemic agents don't come without AEs. Allopurinol, like Anthony said prior, you're going to monitor for skin rash, hypersensitivity, um, also liver, liver dysfunction. Uh, other AEs can include drowsiness, headache, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach discomfort, uh, changes in, in sense of taste, muscle pain, and rash. Uh, Respira case, we also want to monitor for, for hypersensitivity reactions, especially while they're getting the infusion. Other AEs can include um, vomiting, nausea, fever, peripheral edema, anxiety, headache, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, hypophosphatemia, and fer pharyngeal laryngeal pain in, in addition to increase in elevations of ALT. Okay, so here we have um, a little bit more detail here. Again, this is the risk adaptive TLS management uh, can be applied to different patients and uh, malignant settings. Here you have the low risk situation that we've already uh, talked about um, several times. This, uh, for example, could be a fit 66 year old patient with symptomatic stage three follicular lymphoma, no bulky nodes, preparing for bendamustine rituximab. It's probably low risk. Um, intermediate risk patient, I think we've covered this in detail. That's our um, patient who has semi bulky disease starting venetoclax. Um, who could be treated either in the inpatient or the outpatient setting. And then here we have, um, finally, a high-risk patient, young w adult with BALL or Burkitt lymphoma, high white count, bulky disease. Certainly that patient needs to be treated in the inpatient setting. And really the point of this slide is to emphasize that TLS is not just a problem of CLL or the rare pediatric Burkitt lymphoma, but across different malignancies, particularly hematologic malignancies, 
you need to uh, recognize that this can happen and also tailor make the approach so that you are able to address the patient appropriately. I try to identify any uh, modifiable risk factors and really try to manage it so that a patient can receive the therapy successfully. And now I'm gonna go through some take homes uh, for TLS prevention and management. First and foremost, I think what Kristen and I tried to demonstrate today um, is that this isn't a problem that's identified by just the physician. This is a multidisciplinary approach where physician, pharmacist, nurse practitioner, and specialist all work together to try to manage this issue. Um, you really need to understand the diseases that you're treating, try to understand what diseases are high risk, have a, a clinical um, sense of assessment of bulk of disease, how I might risk assess a, CLS, a CLL patient would be different than how one would risk assess a patient with ALL, for example. Um, really try to understand a patient's medical history, comorbidities uh, can factor in, know about cardiac disease when thinking about how many fluids, how much fluids to give someone, know how to calculate a creatinine clearance and assess for baseline renal dysfunction. And then finally, be familiar with the medications that are useful for treating and preventing tumor lysis syndrome. Kristen did a nice job of highlighting some of the side effects associated with allopurinol. These aren't theoretical. We see them in the clinic every day. The same uh, for utilization of respiracase. You need to have an expertise not only in how to manage the patients, but also how to manage this particular consequence because if it occurs, it can be life-threatening and can limit therapy. Uh, we really hope that uh, we were able to uh, come together today, uh, emphasize the multidisciplinary approach, and demonstrate how every single day in our clinic we're risk assessing patients with, uh, for tumor lysis syndrome and preventing this complication. So in conclusion, uh, that is the end of our exploration for TLS and management. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kristen, for uh, that great presentation. Yes, thank you, Anthony, for having me today and for letting me join in this fun conversation about TLS. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YSX860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.